elections are an important aspect of a democratic society, but there is often dispute over the electoral systems that are used in various countries. On today's show, we want to zero in on the English-speaking Caribbean. We look at the electoral systems in that part of the world. That's our show today. Don't go anywhere. Carib Nation Crosstalk is up next. <music> Welcome to Carib Nation Crosstalk, I'm David Hines. Almost five decades after the first countries in the English-speaking Caribbean got independence from Britain, one of the major issues has been electoral reform. The big question is whether the electoral systems in the Caribbean have yielded the kind of democratic results that we often yearn for in those societies. Today to discuss that issue with me is a distinguished panel. We have Mr. Leo Edwards, who is no stranger to Carib Nation. Leo is what I would call a scholar activist, someone who is uh, uh, deeply rooted in the discourse and the activities of Caribbean community here in Washington, DC, and of course, beyond. Mr. Paul Tennessee himself, a political activist and someone who has been part of the electoral process in the Caribbean as a candidate and has observed elections. And then we have uh, my good friend, uh, Ambassador Kinsey Lane, former ambassador of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, someone who has also been part of the electoral process as a candidate in St. Vincent and also observed elections in the Caribbean. So, uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, Leo, let me, let, me, let me start with you. At the time of independence, the Caribbean inherited the Westminster system. And with the Westminster system, it inherited the Westminster electoral process of Port Fazi Post, except for Guyana, which got a different system because of the ethnic circumstances there. Uh, do you think that uh, that uh, Force Pass the Post Westminster system has outlived its usefulness? Well, there is always need for change and improvement. And one has to look at the record. Over the years, there have been many complaints and many attempts to subvert elections. We have caught people running away with boxes containing votes. They've had all kinds of things going on. And so clearly, we have over the years tried to improve <coughs> the system. Recently, in Jamaica at any rate, under P.J. Patterson, an attempt was made to create an independent electoral commission, non-partisan electoral commission, which, which was independent of the government. The government had the right to set the date, but once they set the date, the commission takes over. Um, there are other people around the Caribbean who are opting for proportional representation because they feel that, for example, if a party wins 10 or more percent, they ought to be represented in the government. In Jamaica, for example, since the beginning, the figures show that the people t there are only two viable parties. The PMP generally has a base of 46%. The Labour Party has a base of 42%. If the undecided swing either way, it can be a landslide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul, Paul, let me bring you in here. Um, do, you, do you agree with those who argue that uh, the Westminster model, especially the first past the post model, is an unjust and undemocratic model as far as the Caribbean is concerned? Well, first of all, I think the Westminster model has been stereotyped. I think whenever we speak of the Westminster model, we have to look at it as a package. Um, there are many aspects to the Westminster model. The first principle is that we must have free and fair election, and that is linked to an independent election commission. So we just can't speak about the Westminster model and don't look at the other aspects. The second, another aspect of it is the fact that in parliament itself, the prime minister and the cabinet ministers are under heavy pressures and they uh, have to be accountable. Unlike the presidential system, which is more imperial, the president only addresses parliament when he so pleases and so forth. 
So there are those aspects to it. The other aspect to the Westminster model that is often missed out, and people miss it out about Britain, is the role of local government. Local government in Britain is a very powerful institution in terms of being responsible for education and a lot of other very important services in the local communities. Um, However, I still think that mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, uh, we have had a particular experience and it needs modification, particularly in the Senate. I don't believe the Prime Minister should have the right to name the Senate, that proportional representation perhaps it should be a combination so that if people get votes, they could go to the Senate so that there'd be a balance. Mm -hmm. Kinsey, the same question to you. Yes, I look at this matter in terms of its utility and how well it has served us. I believe that the arguments against a for reform of the system to take into account some degree of proportionality, they are valid. I have no outstanding, no real fundamental problem with the Westminster first past the poll system in the sense that it spreads the concept of sovereignty throughout all the country. Now, you may have a constituency that is overwhelmingly for one party, and there are constituencies in this Caribbean here that have been for one party from the time they start to vote. And there is a reason for that most of the time. There is a, a, a certain reason why a certain area would vote for one party all the time. Some of it is tribalism. But I believe in the sovereignty of the people, and I believe the people all over a country having the opportunity to vote for a candidate in their particular area, they transfer their desire for sovereignty to that representative so that every area of the country becomes important. Now, under our system of primus inter pares, it doesn't have to work because of, uh, over the years we have had emerging a number of dominant prime ministers. I think it's time for prime ministers to understand that they can be prime ministers if their most insignificant candidate doesn't win a seat. So that the people's sovereignty, which is transferred to elected representatives, must be seen to be real. Don't give me a person who you will call a broomstick or this or that just because of you and I vote for that person. The people in any constituency must, must have that feeling of representation for the person who's who they give their vote. I see a linkage there that. between the local government that Paul is talking about and uh, the issue of representation that you are yes. talking about. That representation is important, but it must not be something that Im is imposed by the party on the people and the constituency. That was part of the uh, debate in Trinidad and Tobago recently. As you yes. know, the prime minister there uh, uh, dropped a lot of stalwarts of the party from yes. the parliamentary listening. Even in situations where the constituencies mm -hmm. wanted that person. Leo, a party gets 24% of the vote, as in the case of Trinidad recently, and got zero seats. Another party got 45% of the vote and got 63% of the seat. Is that democratic? No, it is not. And one has to find ways to get around that. <coughs> now, you see, let me tell you. Let let me tell you where I start from. I start from one, I fully support the concept of universal adult suffrage. That is that every citizen above the age of 18 has the right to vote, must be given the opportunity to vote, and must have his or her vote counted. If any of those are violated, we are in trouble. Number two. My problem with the, the Caribbean is, is fundamental. That between 1962 and now, society at large has not, the political development of society at large has been stymied at the level of party loyalty. We have not moved on to national loyalty. Uh, let me bring in Paul here. <coughs> that point that Leo made there, the whole question of the national and the party, the national and the, par the tribal partisan thing, uh, issue, uh, it's, 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 it's a big issue. How do we translate something that is democratic in intent hmm, um, 
but not democratic in outcome. How do we navigate that far? Uh, the way to do it, I think, is that, first of all, we have to admit that the Westminster model has been adapted to, to the Caribbean at a particular time, and it has evolved. For example, we have the House of Lords in England with the Westminster model. We don't have that in the Caribbean. We have a Senate. So that's one aspect that we have to look at. So this is why I'm saying we need a combination of things. First of all, I believe we should have a constituency system so that people could vote for a particular candidate. Because I believe that you need people need in a constituency direct representation. But that constituency but, system has yielded but, this, uh, these uneven results. Yeah, yeah, because it's not combined with other things. Okay. I think for like in the case of COP in Trinidad, as you mentioned, they had a significant percentage of vote. They made inroads to a younger generation that think more nationalist, but they are not either in the Senate or in Parliament. So I'm saying let us have proportional representation for the Senate. And then in local government, I think we should prescribe uh, political parties from participating in local government. We should allow that to be more a civil society kind of representation. So we will have the grassroots having the rep representation in local government. But also, mm -hmm. we need a system where when they make the national budget, that they do put money for local government. No use having people elected. Let, let, and you let don't me pin you down on the civil okay. society because it's an okay. innovative concept of taking parties out of elections local at the local elected. level. Uh, but given what Leo just raised, which is the issue that the countries have become so polarized along party lines, would civil society organizations not become fronts of the political parties? Well, this is the dilemma that civil societies face, whether they're in the United States, whether they're in this Russia, or whether they're in Latin America and the Caribbean. And there is there are governments that are against civil society because they see them as linked to opposition parties. Yes. Well, if this is not if civil societies are linked with political parties, the people would know that. They have the intelligence to know that. So Probably what it will allow is independent people in the community to come together. Because my experience in Guyana, growing up, for example, in a multi-ethnic village in Alnis, Alverston, and, um, and so forth, there were multi-racial groups came together independent of political parties and won local government election. They had no name. They had no tag. But they were multiracial. So I believe there is a feeling in the local community that they, they want their board certificates, they want their education, they want health services, they want the basic services, and they want to have some control of it in the community. Kingsley, you uh, uh, observed the 2007 elections in uh, Jamaica. What are the problems you saw there manifesting itself in terms of the electoral system? Well, the first fear I had based on what I was reading in the polls, is that with 60 seats, the possibility of a tie was statistically possible. And because I, I recall that one of the papers I saw um, when I arrived in the country said, this is a dead heat. And so it could go anywhere. In fact, election night, when we, we were listening to the results coming, it looked definitely like 30, 30 was on the card. I happened to say that I was in Trinidad when they had the 1818 election. So I say, like, this thing is swallowing me around, you know. But however, I want to take this opportunity to commend the Jamaican people you know, I, 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 for the way they take their election seriously. I'm not talking about the excesses of violence or anything. But I saw a manifestation of civil involvement in the electoral process, which is a very healthy expression. I saw um, in all the polling stations that I covered, I saw an, a remarkable level of cooperation among the agents and the electoral officials. In Jamaica, you have a very, very potent organization called Citizens Association for Free and Fair Elections, called CAFE. They had a representative in every polling, mm -hmm. polling station. And so therefore, the importance of civil society was there was made a difference. Right. And Leo Edwards, uh, how about a mixed system uh, let's say in Jamaica where you have 60 seats, you have 30 of those seats are uh, fought for in the first past the post system, the constituency system, and the next 30 seats being fought for uh, along a proportional representation system. Is that a viable way out? 
Well, that, that, that is going to be very difficult in Jamaica. Tell me why. <clears throat> because at the present time, the only, the, the motivation of voters in the Caribbean, including Jamaica, is that their party should win and control the government. And this is what is bothering me. You, you can motivate people throughout the Caribbean to fight and die for their party. If you tell them about the national interest, they ask you, what is that? Nobody is going to fight, much less die, mm -hmm. for the national interest. Okay, so Leo, no, no, but just ahead. Yes. If we cannot develop to the point where we understand the concept of the national interest, how can we understand the concept of the regional interest, which is where we have to go? All right? No. So what I am more interested in is a system, and this has to do means we have to step back and look at the educational system, and we have to look at public political education, which is the responsibility of the parties. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to now talk about what is the responsibility of political parties in terms of political education, and what is the, is the responsibility of the formal education system for the people at large, so that when they go to vote, they know what they're voting for and what is at the end of the rainbow, mm -hmm. right? The mixed well, system? Well, the mixed system, I support a combination of mixed system, but first of all, this means co a comprehensive reform of the electoral system, which is linked to reform of the respective constitution. Now, what I would like to talk about is the fundamentals of this system. One is, I'd like to see a combination of first past the poll and proportional representation. First past the poll parliament, proportional representation for Senate. Secondly, I'd like to see local government having a more open space for civil society rather than political parties to balance precisely what Leo speaks about, the paramountcy of parties vis-a-vis -vis grassroots and civil society. But what I would like to see as a fundamental of electoral system a democratic electoral system is an independent election commission that makes that allows mandatory voting and voter education not in the hands of political parties because it would be difficult for them to distinguish partisan political education from voter education from a civic national nationalist regional sense and all that so i see a combination uh, of elements that we have to put together. But I think it's very possible we could sit down and design such a comprehensive reform that would respond to many of the deficiencies of the uh, attempt by us since political independence to adapt the Westminster model or to depart from it as Grenada did during the Bishop period and post-Bishop and as Guyana did during the Burnham and the proportional representation. Uh, uh, mixed system and local government? Yes. Um, uh, the mixed system, uh, some European countries, and I think Germany, uh, does Germany in particular, yeah. have adopted that. But I, I want to focus in, I come from St. Vincent and Grenadine. Okay. Right. And we have one level of election, and that is national elections. Local government was ruled out some years ago, I think in the 17th. We don't have local government, and we don't have a Senate. We have a unicameral legislature. Now for me, and this is my gut feeling as a member of a Vincentian, the most important thing for us is a, an electoral system that treasures and delivers the concept of one person, one vote, elections without fear, and, 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 and transparency. We have developed in St. Vincent over the years since we got universal adult suffrage in 1951. The electoral office is a part of the government, but it was always headed by men of impeccable credentials in terms of their commitment to the transparency of the system. I am now afraid from my observations that the system could be tampered with. St. Vincent had developed to such a level where our supervisors of elections were commonly asked to go to small countries in the South Pacific and so on to share of their expertise. 
Now, for me in St. Vincent, the most important step for us as a majority Afro country, unlike you have in some, uh, many other places, but we have all the other ethnicities and so on. I think that the process of um, universal adult suffrage is a continuation of that whole system of emancipation up to where we are today, fighting for a foothold in the world economic system and so on. It is a part of the system of emancipation. And I believe very strongly that for us in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is to maintain the absolute integrity of that system. And that, because one of the reasons why we did what got away from local government is cost, because we're talking about a poor country. You know. These layers of government also bring with them costs. Sometimes you can't even run your central government. And don't, I don't believe we should just jump on reforms and this and that because everybody doing it. You understand? We must use what is functional to us. And I believe in St. Vincent, once you have an impeccable system and we go in in the direction of an independent election commission which is under the control of a, a commission that cannot be intimidated by any government. But David, yes, they, they, yes. We, we are leaving two important variables out of our radar. Mm -hmm. One is the role of the media in elections now in the Caribbean and who finances it and possibly hijacks elections, independent of the electorate. And the second thing is the role of polls. Mm -hmm. They have become very important in who can afford polls and who can get to the television station. Because now we have cable, television, and all this, that's why I'm speaking of a comprehensive reform with a comprehensive package. Mm -hmm. Leo, should there be a comprehensive reform? And if so, should we have like standard electoral systems throughout the Caribbean? Well, eventually, I think we might get to that. And I think that's what we are trying to work on. Um, as you know, for many years in Jamaica, let me talk about Jamaica, mm -hmm. which I know mo most about. For many years, every election, there was complaints that, that a fraud, particularly in certain areas. And a conscious effort has been made to get rid of that. And in fairness to both parties, over the past 10 years, the both parties agreed that there are some issues that are so fundamental for governance, particularly in small countries, that this idea that whenever A is in, whatever they do, if B comes in, B throws out everything. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Which does, so we are always starting from ground zero whenever we change government. We therefore sat down and identified certain areas that, li that are fundamental to national development. Education, health, and voting, first three. And we said, can the parties come together and agree upon an independent commission in these three fields so that the product that is approved continues on whether the government is in power or not. Mm -hmm. Because the incoming government would also have an interest in it, having contributed to its creation. All right. Now, that is what Jamaica has done. And we have established, therefore, this independent electoral commission, which everybody reports is do has done very, very well. Mm -hmm. Now, that to me is more fundamental than whether or not it is proportional. I think because, and, then, and, I, and I go back, if the society, you see, societies are nothing more than a collection of human beings. And a human being learns in three stages. The first stage is imitation. The second stage is trial and error. And the third stage is conceptual thinking. Now, what has happened to us? Our electorates have learned from their leader by imitation and by trial and error. And we have yet to move to the level of conceptual thinking. This is a failing fundamentally of our formal educational system and of the education of the general public. And that is what is missing. In, and that's why I want to agree with Paul mm -hmm. on this point. Mm -hmm. One of the functions of an, an electoral commission must be to 
undertake voter education, not for a party. The party is free to do that within its constituencies. But, but there must be a system of voter education and general education about national development and regional development. Because when you're edu being educated, you must be educated for something. Leo <laughs> Edwards, a sage of the Caribbean community here in Washington, D.C. We'll take a short break. And when we come back, we'll have hindsight, my sight, my view. <laughs> we'll be right back. When America wants to know what's happening in the Caribbean diaspora, there is one clear choice. Hello, welcome to Carib Nation. Both people inside and outside are very excited about today's program. Looking at you, I can tell that you've traveled the journey. <laughs> one television organization brings America close to the people, stories, and events that affects Caribbean life. Get close, get answers, get Carib Nation. Welcome back to Carib Nation Crosstalk. Elections, I said at the beginning of the program, is a fundamental aspect of a democratic society. But elections are both electoral, e electoral inputs and electoral outcomes. Often, the input may be democratic, but the outcome may not be democratic. How do we account for the disparity between popular votes gotten by political parties and the seats they get at the end of the election? I think Leo, Leo Edwards has hit on the fundamental problem in Caribbean electoral system. And that is that those electoral systems are geared to producing triumphal, triumphalist parties and not national governments. I think the Caribbean has to reach now for national governments, for a national community. And that national community must not only be Jamaican and Caribbean and Barbadian and St. Lucian and St. Vincentian, but it must be Caribbean. And if we are to get there, we must begin in the local governments that Paul Tennessee said, where people reside in their villages and their little towns and their neighborhood. And so therefore, a comprehensive, a comprehensive electoral reform package is needed. After all, 50 years after independence, it's enough time for us to look back and say, where have we gone wrong, and how can we move forward? I want to thank you for tuning in to yet another edition of Carib Nation Crosstalk, and I want to thank my panel, Kings Delane. It's good to see you again, Ambassador Paul, my friend, always as energetic. And Leo, as always, you always give always us the wisdom of a long, long years in the trenches. If you like our program today, then visit us at carbnationtv.com and let us know your feedback. Until the next time, this is David Hines thanking you for tuning in to yet another edition of Carib Nation Crosstalk. See you next time.